Joining me now, Bharat Ramamurti, Deputy Director of the National Economic Council. Mr. Ramamurti, thank you very much for coming to the Sunday show. Now, I want you to clear something up for me. Earlier in the week, the New York Times and Punchbowl reported that negotiators were, quote, discussing a mechanism that would incentivize Congress to pass all 12 appropriations bills before the end of the fiscal year. Is that a part of the tentative agreement? Because this would be significant because it would put the budget discussions back into the budget process. Yeah, that's right. I, I want to take a step back and just say uh -huh. uh, we have an agreement in principle that accomplishes two, two main things. Number one, it takes the possibility of a devastating <clears throat> default on our debt uh, off the table, something that would have done a tremendous harm to uh, American finances, Americans' retirement accounts. And number two, this agreement uh, preserves the incredible progress that we've made on the economy over the last two years. Remember, over 12 million jobs created, uh, signature pieces of legislation passed in the last two years. All of those are preserved and locked in in this agreement. So uh, to answer your specific question, uh, no, what this does is basically it resumes the, the normal uh, budgeting process. Uh, there's no uh, significant changes to that. It is a, a two-year agreement uh, on spending caps, which, again, is a, is a very typical uh, conversation that you have when you have uh, divided government. So in effect, this is a, an agreement that uh, resembles uh, pr prior agreements that we've had when there's been uh, divided government. So the so the 12 appropriations bills that that particular process that's in this tentative agreement or or not another way was chosen just want to get that clear. Yes, there are incentives here that if 12 appropriations bills are not passed, then certain procedures take in place to effectively have a, a continuing resolution. But again, that is fairly consistent with uh, prior practice. Got it. OK, so in short, the answer is yes. <laughs> Mr. Ramamurti, why did the administration give on work requirements for some federal aid recipients? Well, it was more like a trade. Uh, as you noted there, there was, uh, number one, an attempt by Republicans to impose work requirements on the Medicaid program, something that would have potentially jeopardized health insurance for more than 20 million people. None of that is in this agreement. Uh, there were certain re work requirements that Republicans were pursuing on the SNAP program to a very narrow set of recipients. Uh, those were agreed to, but in exchange, the president was able to secure an expansion of the SNAP program so that uh, homeless people and veterans were actually getting more protections than they were before. So I, I, would, I would view that as an exchange that may have the net effect of actually uh, improving the SNAP program. So um, or, or earlier this week, Fitch Ratings put the U.S. credit uh, on a negative watch list. How will this tentative deal impact that? Well, look, we got to get this deal passed. Uh, it, it's, it doesn't do any good if it's just an agreement in principle that doesn't get to the president's desk and signed. So as the president said in his statement last night, uh, once we have the text released, uh, he encourages both the House and the Senate to move quickly to pass it. As you noted at the top of this segment, Secretary Yellen has said that June 5th is effectively the deadline here where the possibility of default becomes very real. We have a, a bunch of steps to do before then. So uh, as long as we get this bill passed through the House, passed through the Senate, and signed by the president in advance of that June 5th deadline, we should avert the consequences uh, that the rating agencies were talking about. And that's a good segue to my last question, and that is, what's your level of confidence that a deal can get done passed in the House, passed in the Senate, and signed by the president in time to avoid default? Well, uh, look, I think because of the consequences of not passing the deal, uh, I, I think it's in incumbent about on both the House and the Senate to move quickly and to deal with it. This is a compromise. Not everybody's going to get uh, what they want. That's how it works. Uh, but there's an awful lot in here for both Democrats and Republicans to support and to want. Uh, most importantly, taking the possibility of a default off the table that would hurt constituents across the country, whether they're in Republican districts or Democratic districts. So uh, we encourage both the House and the Senate uh, to take a hard look at this deal. It's a fair deal, and they should pass it. Deputy Director of the National Economic Council, Bharat Ramamurti, thank you very much for coming to the Sunday show this morning. Thank you. Joining us now is the assistant Democratic leader in the House of Representatives, Congressman James Clyburn of South Carolina, a national co-chair of the Biden-Harris 2024 campaign. Mr. Clyburn, as always, thank you very much for coming to the Sunday show. Your initial thoughts on the tentative agreement. Are there any non-starters in this tentative deal for you? Uh, there's absolutely no non-starters at all. 
Am I satisfied totally? No, I'm not. Uh, but uh, as Ms. Ramadute, uh, if I pronounce his name correctly, said, in these kinds of the negotiations, nobody gets all of what they want. Uh, I do know that I have not seen the paper. My staff has been informing me this morning of what's in it and what's out of it. And I'm very, very comfortable that we can get to a good place uh, on both sides of the aisle. Thanks ought to go out, though, uh, to those negotiators. Uh, Solana Young, Steve Rossetti, uh, Louisa Terry, they've been great on our sides. I think that um, uh, Congressman uh, McHenry and Graves uh, have done great work on the Republican side, and we ought to thank them for the great work they've done. Having said that, we have to have time to look at the details to make sure that we can get to a, a very comfortable level on all of this. Will I get all of what I want? No. Or will they get all of what they want? No. But I'm very pleased that we're in a good place. So, uh, um, Mr. Kleiber, many Democrats said that work requirements were a red line for them. Uh, they are in the agreement for some uh, recipients. Will you vote against the measure because of that? And I'm also wondering what your staff is telling you about those work requirements. Are they as onerous as uh, Democrats have feared? Well, we were fearful uh, about that. But when you look, uh, move into the so-called able-bodied requirement uh, from 49 up to 54, which is what I understand it is, and then you are uh, expanding, though, uh, for veterans. Uh, we hear so much about what's happening to our veterans, who many of whom find themselves uh, in need uh, of SNAP programs. We're expanding that. We're expanding it for the homelessness. We hear a whole lot about the homelessness. But what Joe Biden has done, he's had more compassion than what we have. And at the same time, he has compromised on moving able-bodiedness from 45 to 54. And that phases out uh, about 2020. So that's a pretty good compromise, though I would have loved to just let it stay at 49. But uh, if that's what he has to give to bring in more veterans, to bring in more of the homelessness, uh, I think it's a good deal.